I'm Barbara Epstein, director of the University of Pittsburgh's Health Sciences Library System, better known as HSLS. Our library offers support and collaboration for the university's six schools of the health sciences. In this inclusive environment, we offer a wide array of information services, educational opportunities, and resources in print and electronic format. Our virtual and online services are featured on the HSLS website, and our physical home of Falk Library provides spaces to study, collections, and exhibits to engage our visitors, and day-to-day -day support for questions and assistance within the health sciences community. It's my privilege to introduce you to our featured historical collections from our rare books room. The rare books and special collections at HSLS consist of more than 10,000 medical texts and artifacts published as early as 1496, as well as print and audiovisual materials of local interest, which span more recent decades. Founded in 1883 in conjunction with the Chartering of Pitt School of Medicine, the library's collection began with contributions from the first faculty members of the school and has grown to feature an international array of sought source materials. Today's historical collection, housed in Falk Library at Scaife Hall on Pitt's Oakland campus, brings together rare books from the former libraries of Pitt's Schools of Medicine, Dental Medicine, Graduate School of Public Health, Nursing, Pharmacy, and the UPMC Western Psychiatric Institute and Clinic. The collection does not normally purchase new artifacts, but donations of private collections have contributed to the continued growth of this unique collection. The collection is available to students and faculty, as well as the public by appointment. In 2019, a new space was created in Falk Library to house the collection and ensure the preservation and longevity of the materials it contains. Dr. Gosha Fort, Head of Digital Resource Development manages the organization, access, and preservation for rare book and special collections. In her role, she also oversees web-based and digital projects, which increase the visibility of library historical collections. Gosha has been a part of HSLS for over 20 years and frequently shares collection highlights with the Pitt community through the HSLS Update newsletter. Today, she will be featuring select items from the collection rarely seen by the public. We hope you enjoy this episode of Medical Treasures of the Health Sciences Library System. Episode 1, Enhancing Medical Teaching with Illustrations. I'm very pleased to be presenting today on illustrations as they were used in enhancing medical teaching. Illustrations accompany medical textbooks from the very beginning. Early publishers of medical texts were always eager to adopt technological novelties in printing to enhance the educational power of text. Today's examples will focus on unusual illustrations in our collection. I will show books with flap anatomies, books with early photographs, and novelty prints. I'd like to start by showing the most valuable book in our collection, the Humani Corporis Fabrica Librorum by Andrea Vesalius from 1543. I pulled out this book not to talk about the importance of this publication, nor to praise Vesalius' skills as anatomist, nor to admire great woodcuts illustrating this revolutionary atlas of anatomy. I want to talk about flat anatomies, a technique where cut out illustrations of organs are assembled together into a layered mannequin. The idea is to enhance the two dimensional image by adding more details and by showing inside organs otherwise hidden behind different layers in a complex human body. 
It is a very clever way to convey three-dimensional body on a flat page. I want to show you specifically one plate from our copy of Fabrica, which was designed for the creation of flat anatomy. The plate 313, illustrating vascular system, is followed by a page with images. Though, as you see, our copy has the pages intact. Nobody cut out the pieces to assemble them over the appropriate plate. But we can get a sense how it would look like when assembled by viewing University of Cambridge copy of Epitom. Epitom was a concise version of Fabrica, also published in 1543. It was one of the first books to integrate this technique. It included illustrations of the body and a pair of pages containing anatomical parts that could be cut out, pasted, and configured into a functional paper flat anatomy. The publication of Lift the Flat Anatomy Books reached its apex in the 19th century. By that time, printing technology evolved, flaps became easier to produce, they were more sturdy, and appeared in vibrant dramatic colors, presenting a human body mannequin from the book Portfolio of Life, published in 1891. Lifting the first layer, we see the muscle section of the mannequin. The next flap uncovers the section of the thorax with collarbone, ribs, and muscles between ribs visible. Next, we see the outer section of lungs, followed by inner view of lungs with windpipe, aorta, and grain vein to heart. The next layer reveals the outer section of heart. Then we are uncovering the inner section of heart. Lifting yet another layer, we see first abdominal section showing bladder and fat under the abdominal lining. The next two small flaps show the sections of liver. Then we go to the section of stomach and intestines with a separate small flap illustrating inner mucus lining. And finally, we see the rear section of body unveiling spleen, pancreas, kidneys, arteries, and veins. The next two examples will focus on photographs in our books. The 19th century invention of photography captured the attention of medical profession. This new technology offered physicians a more objective and more accurate tool to record medical conditions and observations than the illustration they used in the past. We are looking at Richard Barwell's book on the cure of the club foot without cutting tendons and on certain new methods of treating other deformities from 1865. This edition features early photographs known as albumen prints. Albumen prints were developed by Desiree Blancard Everard 
in 1850. Because they were easy to use by professionals and amateurs alike, they quickly became the print medium of choice. They were printed from web negatives, which dominated photography in the second half of 19th century and were set in wooden printing frames exposed to direct light. The print was then removed from the frame and processed in a lit room. The author, Richard Barlow, was an assistant surgeon at the Charing Cross Hospital in London and was mostly interested in orthopedic surgery. He took pictures of his patients himself. He admitted in the preface that the quality of some could have been better had he had the luxury of waiting for the perfect shooting condition. The photographs illustrate six cases as described in the book. The patients are identified by initials. The photographs capture and illustrate the patient's medical conditions better than any written description. This little book has also a very interesting Pittsburgh provenance. Its first owner, Dr. A.G. Walter, built a private hospital in 1850 at the site known as Boyd's Hill. The Spiritans, founders of the Duquesne University, bought the building from Walter's heirs and moved it to another location. The small former hospital structure became the first campus building of Duquesne University. The last owner of the book, who donated it to our collection, was Oscar Klotz, Canadian pathologist who was professor of pathology and bacteriology at the University of Pittsburgh from 1909 to 1920. Next example introduces stereoscopic photographs. Stereoscopy is a technique for creating depth in an image by presenting two offset images separately to the left and right eye of the view. In 1838, Charles Wheatstone showed that the illusion of depth could be created from flat pictures that differed only in horizontal disparity. In the second half of 19th century, photography and the invention of the prism stereoscope by David Brewster popularized side-by-side -side pictures even more. Since objects could be experienced in 3D, stereoscopic images became widely used in books about geography, history, and of course in medicine. We are looking at stereoscope builder Tur Leire von der Ernien by Enderlen and Gasse, published in 1906. This book comes from our Mark Ravitch hernia collection. This atlas of hernias is an example of the cooperation between surgeon Enderland and anatomist Gasser. It includes photographs of dissected preparations that illustrate the anatomy of hernias. They come from what is known today as the Gasser Strahl collection in the Anatomical Institute at the Philip University in Marburg, Germany. The atlas consists of 72 pages of text and 17 cardboard slide holders, which contain side-by-side -side photographs. Each pair of images is matched with a corresponding description on the opposite page. 
For purposes of clarity, some of the photographs were enhanced with color. The same color code was used throughout the atlas. Red for arteries, blue for veins, and yellow for nerves. When adding color was superfluous, the images were left unchanged. As intended by the authors, the atlas can be viewed using any standard stereoscope. To view images, I'm using Howley's white stereoscope from about 1905 from our collection. However, the naked eye can be trained to perceive the depth of stereoscopic pictures and give the users the illusion of a 3D image without the use of a stereoscope. My final example illustrates the novelty print techniques used in medical books. I open today's talk by showing you anatomical atlas, and I would like to close the first episode by showing you another one. We are looking at the anatomical atlas illustrated by Gautier de Gautier, Meologie Complete, from 1746, in which all illustrations of the human body are rendered by a new printing technique. This technique consisted of etching and metal engraving of a metal plate, to which color ink was applied, and then four separate impressions were made from black, red, yellow, and blue plates to give the final image all its color. It's interesting that you can have a glimpse of this technique because when those impressions were not perfectly aligned, you can see the individual colors on the brim of some plates. Dagoti did not invent this technique, since color printing using red, yellow, and blue was done earlier by French printer Leblanc. But he mastered it and improved it by adding the fourth color, black. He produced his first color printed image of a shell in 1737. He started his color printing business by making reproductions of oil painting, but soon turned to producing color printed images for science. In Meology, his Atlas of Muscles, the plates have a spectacular final effect. The rich color, details of the drawing, and the glossy finish make his illustrations stand out and literally shine, giving the viewer the impression that he is not looking at a printed image, but at a true oil painting. This atlas includes also, as you see, one of the largest book illustrations in our collection. In the next episode, what is rare there, I will talk about what makes a book rare and show you some gems and rarities in our collection. If you have any questions about items presented today, please contact me by email or phone. To contact Gosha Fort, please send an email to gosia at pit.edu or call 412-648-4162.